Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much, Professor Kamina Gunaratna, uh, the chair of the panel, for your kind introduction. Uh, Dean Mr. Amaradha, sir, Faculty of Law, and uh, the fellow panelists of the same uh, session, uh, Academia, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and my dear students. The uh, topic chosen uh, for this panel session by me is Challenges to Human Rights in the Face of Terrorism, uh, Domestic and International Legal Responses. In fact, uh, I thought to uh, uh, select this specific topic uh, in the uh, backdrop of the recently occurred unfortunate uh, bomb blast on the day of uh, Easter Sunday. With that, we found the ugly head of terrorism has reappeared and also with the same situation, the need to counter terrorism also has resurfaced as one of the key priorities. So, in this backdrop, the old debates on the conflict of interest between the needs to maintain national and international security and also to protect the rights of people and their freedom and social harmony also emerge with the new vigor. Hence, in this uh, situation, it is very much important for us to examine as well as to analyze the relevant international and domestic counter-terrorism laws and responses and their impact on protection of human rights which are categorically subject to counter-terrorism measures in any society and I thought to do that with a special focus on the contemporary Sri Lankan debates on this issue. Also, I hope to recommend how to make a balance between the need to uh, tackle with the uh, security issues as well as to protect and promote human rights of the people. Uh, due to the very uh, limited time, uh, I uh, thought that uh, first I will present my paper. Uh, I will read out uh, my key uh, observations as well as the main findings with a couple of recommendations. Uh, in the uh, question and answer forum, I am going to discuss it further. So I would say that some states use discriminatory counter-terrorism measures while arresting, interrogating and committing the suspects and engage in torture and other inhumane and degrading treatment and punishments. These actions violate international and domestic human rights standards and safeguards also may undermine the independence of the judiciary. Establishment of special courts and tribunals and adoption of draconian legislations would lead to being sentences based on merits and non-legal objectives. State power might be used to suppress the voices of human rights defenders, journalists, vulnerable groups, as well as the civil society. Now please look at this diagram. You will find in a fragile situation, one of the first things that you may find is human rights violations. When the rights of the people are violated, they may prone to engage in some terrorist activities and unacceptable illegal things that would surely lead to terrorism. When the terrorism is in a society, that will lead to many sabotage activities and other illegal uh, uh, disturbances as well as uh, some of the other damages which I am sure would lead to again human rights violations. When human rights violations coupled with terrorism occur, there is a need to take counter-terrorism measures. When those counter-terrorism measures are taken, there should be some steps to be taken to curtail human rights of people. When uh, human rights are subject to those limitations, again human rights violations would occur. So needless to explain how this vicious cycle would repeat over and again. So this uh, research is a qualitative research that has used both primary as well as secondary data. When I am talking about Sri Lankan uh, legal responses with regard to counter-terrorism, and its relationship to human rights violations, I have basically looked at in my paper on the relevant provisions of the 1978 Constitution of Sri Lanka and also Public Security Ordinance and the current emergency laws in operation. Also some selected provisions of the Prevention of Terrorism Act and the discourses currently happening on the proposed counter-terrorism bill uh, are discussed in this presentation. So we all know uh, with the September 11th attack in 2001 which happened in US that 
fight against terrorism, a discourse happened and many counter-terrorism measures are introduced globally and domestically. Therefore, initially we could see those counter-terrorism initiatives, measures and actions did not pay much attention to the protection of human rights and they engage in terrorism and re-establishing security in all those circumstances. When we look at the steps taken by the highest security body at the United Nations level, that is the UN Security Council, we could see the council has declared that the phenomenon of international terrorism as a threat to international peace and security and also they impose certain measures under the provisions of the chapter 7 of the UN Charter in order to counter terrorism. So for that purpose, they adopted a resolution uh, number 1373 in 2001. A counter-terrorism committee also was created by the Security Council in order to monitor the state's compliance with the resolution and with that human rights actors all over the world found themselves are marginalized when the counter-terrorism act committee did not want to hear them. And also when some states involved Article 103 of the UN Charter as an explanation why their counter-terrorism obligations would trump their human rights commitment. If you look at uh, uh, Article 103 of the UN Char Charter, which states that in the event of a conflict between obligations of the members of the United Nations under the present Charter and their obligations under any other international agreement, their obligation under the present charter shall prevail. So you will find the very special place of the UN Charter provisions over their other treaty obligations. However, some treaty bodies such as the UN Human Rights Committee acting under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights developed a systematic practice of addressing and assessing states for their counter-terrorism missions. In 2005, the UN Commission for Human Rights, which was about to be replaced by the current UN Human Rights Council, established the mandate of a special rapporteur on the promotion and protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms while countering the terrorism. I think this appointment was a reopening of the dialogue and the need to balance between human rights protection with the counter-terrorism missions. Meanwhile, in 2006, the UN General Assembly adopted the UN United Nations Global Counter-Terrorism Strategy, which assured that effective counter-terrorism missions and the protection of human rights are not conflicting goals, but complementary and mutually reinforcing ones. So now you, you can look at the United Nations Global Counter-Terrorism Strategy, which include four pillars. I will briefly look at these four pillars which urge to respect for human rights for all and the rule of law with the utmost priority. So we find the measures to ensure respect for human rights for all and the rule of law form one of the four pillars, actually the last pillar of the strategy, however at the same time a component in all other pillars. Therefore, the title of the fourth pillar identifies this principle as the fundamental basis of the fight against terrorism and naturally more attention should have been paid to the protection of human rights as well as establishing rule of law. This strategy recognizes that it is necessary to address the long-term structural conditions which should be conducive to the spread of terrorism. It includes interior, the lack of rule of law and violations of human rights ethnic, national and religious discrimination, political exclusion, socio-economic marginalization and lack of good governance. Also, this strategy represented a clear affirmation by member states that effective counter-terrorism measures and the protection of human rights are not conflicting but complementary and mutually reinforcing goals. Therefore, human rights and the rule of law are the fundamental basis of their counter-terrorism strategies. So moving to uh, the United Nations Secretary General's report titled Uniting Against Terrorism, which identified the defense of human rights as essential to the fulfillment of all aspects of an effective counter-terrorism strategy. So uh, with that, the Secret Council has taken a new move out from their previous stance we find they have adopted two resolutions, 
one in 2005 that he shook a concern terrorist screening and passenger security procedures and another Security Council resolution that to establish the mandate of the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Counter Terrorism. So now we will briefly look at what are the obligations of a sovereign state. This strategy actually recognized that not only counter terrorism and human rights protection are interlinked, but mutually reinforcing. With that, compliance with human rights has the additional practical advantage in bringing the perpetrators of terrorist act to justice. States possess an undeniable obligation which emanates from customary international law as well as from the treaties to which they are parties that to protect their people who are within their jurisdiction and from those acts of terrorism. However, in reality, for some governments, the adoption of this strategy was more a lip service than a genuine commitment to human rights. The practical situations show us that insensitivity to, uh, insensitivity to human rights in counter-terrorism uh, or conditions conducive to the spread of terrorism as perpetuating exclusion and resentment and at the level of triggering causes that is psychological factors that may push a bitter individual to make an inexcusable choice of resorting to acts of terrorism. Now look at this uh, the statement given by Frederick Newshaw in 1886. He said, he who fights with monsters should be careful lest he thereby becomes a monster. And if thou gaze looking into an abyss, the abyss will also gaze into thee. So we have to be very careful not to turn an innocent human being by way of employing those counter-terrorism measures into another terrorist. Now there is a growing recognition that effective counter-terrorism measures and the protection of human rights are complementary. So therefore there is a broad understanding that human rights compliance is not an obstacle to countering terrorism. As a result, many governments and their counter-terrorism uh, uh, agents are more keen now to ensure human rights compliance in counter-terrorism. The citizens also are alerted about establishing the national security while safeguarding their human rights. As noted by the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, some states have engaged in torture and other ill treatment to counter terrorism. While the legal and practical safeguards available to prevent torture, such as regular and independent monitoring of detention centers, have often been disregarded. Other states have returned persons suspected of engaging terrorist activities to countries where they face a real risk of torture or other serious human rights abuse, thereby violating the international legal obligation of right to non reforma which is a customary humanitarian law principle. So I should say that we should remember the fact that we also wanted to return those who India Muslim families who came here for sure that their lives back to the same country where their lives were not secure. So now I will uh, move to uh, 2005 World Summit outcome on the question of respect for human rights while countering terrorism. I am not going to read out this uh, longer passage, but I will move to uh, discuss about one of the recent statements made by the UN Human Rights Council in 2008. The Council began a clustered interactive dialogue with the Special Rapporteur on the Protection and Promotion of Human Rights while countering terrorism. According to her, the uh, first thematic report presented to the UN Human Rights Council, uh, the Special Rapporteur expressed deep concern about the normalization of emergency powers in national legal systems, sometimes in the name of countering terrorism and what happened in a country, that emergency has become a permanent phenomenon in a country and we don't know when that emergency uh, would be lifted. Therefore, states of emergency now have become synonymous with sustained and extensive human rights violations. A vague and overtly broad definition of terrorism, actually in most of cases, we find the definition of terrorism is used as that we want, how to that we are going to, whom to be uh, arrested and negotiated, etc. without having a proper, uh, proper uh, definition of that. Uh, I will ask a couple of uh, present. Uh, how many minutes are you have? 
Okay, so now I will uh, move to uh, some of the proposals. How would states remain in compliance with their human rights treaty obligations? States have to fulfill their concrete international obligations and when devising counterterrorism legislation, a threshold of legality, legitimacy, necessity and proportionality had to be ensured. Periodic reviews of counterterrorism legislation had to be undertaken to assess the impact on human rights. Judicial oversight was necessary in all stages of emergency power practice. A, pra a practical national benchmark was strongly recommended, particularly on the effects of measures had to uh, on ethnic minorities. I am not going to uh, discuss about the uh, principles which are you are familiar with the Sri Lankan constitution and in particular the provisions of the fundamental rights chapter, some of the non derogable rights which cannot be violated even in an emergency or even a war situation, but there are certain derogable rights which is subjected to the limitations of Article 15 and our own local uh, counter-terrorism uh, piece of legislation now is Prevention of Terrorism Act and there is a proposed counter-terrorism bill as well. Moving to my results as well as findings, uh, my research paper emphasized the need to comply with human rights while countering terrorism and argues that both objectives can be achieved by respecting the rule of law, paying due care and refraining from using arbitrary power. Counterterrorism measures should not be a justification to derogate from human rights protection. Protecting the non-derogable rights, so the absolute rights guaranteed by the constitution without limitations and upholding the other fundamental rights with minimum limitations as required by the exigencies of the situation is paramount. The need for a strong state which has the capacity to encapsulate both interests together is emphasized. Failure of the state to take necessary precautions to avoid the Easter Sunday blast may provide evidence that Sri Lanka is a fragile state which could not guarantee the security of people. The lack of respect for human rights could be a reason for unhealthy factions and extremist opinions among the people. People's demand for protection of human rights is a demand to guarantee their rights to live in a free and safe society. All the organs of the government should pay their respective roles promptly and efficiently. The current discourse based on the comparison of the PDA and the counterism bill is very relevant to this discussion. Both include merits as well as demerits, but this paper proposes a balanced approach between the two. Repealing the PDA should not leave a space to weaken the security, but at the same time should not be used to undermine the rights of the people. So moving to my conclusion, States must ensure that any measures taken to combat terrorism comply with their obligations under international law, in particular human rights law, refugee law and international humanitarian law. International Convention for the Suppression of the Financing of Terrorism includes provisions to this effect. Sri Lanka in the aftermath of the blast should issue stringent guidelines to the law enforcement officials to follow when arresting, interrogating and detailing the suspects of terrorist activities to minimize the chances where personal liberties would be infringed. The paper noted the recent request made by the Supreme Court upon Ishara Anjali versus Varuni Bogahavata case, the recent fundamental right case over the rights of a child who was detained unlawfully by the police in Mathur area. The National Human Rights Commission also issued some of the directives to the Inspector General of Police requesting such guidelines to the police. However, abolishing the PDA with no better alternative will aggravate the possible terrorist threats. Therefore, reforms are a must, but it should not weaken the security in the country, but should pay great due care and attention to the protection of human rights of people. I will end my presentation having this quotation by once the Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, under his report uh, titled Uniting Against Terrorism. I uh, open course. Effective counter terrorism measures and the protection of human rights are not conflicting goals, but complementary and mutually reinforcing ones. He identified the defense of human rights as essential to the fulfillment of all aspects of an effective counter terrorism strategy and identified human rights as having a central role in every substantive section of his report. The Secretary General stated that only by honoring and strengthening the human rights of a clan, 
uh, all, all can international communities succeed in its defense to fight this uh, scourge. So thank you very much.